Hello there. How you doing? They can't answer back. I, know, I mean, but they you could, could technically. You could yeah. Just say I'm doing good. Yeah. Hey guys, uh, we're back at another episode of Meaningful People Podcast. We sat down with Mrs. Robertson, Robertson, Mrs. Whatever you want to call it, Slovy Young Rice Wolf. Yeah, and uh, as as you could see, you'll hear in it. We're we're, we're not even sure how to refer to her. Um, cause she, in certain ways she feels like a Rebison, but she also feels like a missus and, and she's great. And obviously we talked to her about what she's up to now. We talked to her about her, her parents legacy. And obviously we, we, we spoke about her, her mother, uh, Rebison Young Rice, Oliver Shalom. And this episode, we, we, we go through a lot of topics and, and questions. Like one of the questions is how could we be a better spouse or how can I be a better parent? Should I? Be giving my kids this? Should I not be giving my kids? Do I step in? Do I not step in? There's so much that we were able to delve into with this episode, and it was really a great conversation. It was it was insightful, and I had fun. Naki had a lot of great analogies talking about <laughs> caterpillars, and you, you'll hear more about it. Uh, but either way, enjoy the rest of the episode. <laughs> Welcome to the Meaningful People Podcast, the podcast where we talk to people who are meaningful. Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> Sitting here with, I'm not sure if it's Rebitson Wolf or Mrs. Wolf. Or uh, Slavi. Or Slavi. I yes. definitely don't want to call you Slavi. <laughs> okay. Uh, you're probably the first Slavi that I ever met. Wow. Do you know more Slavis? I don't know. I, I don't really. Uh, Slavi, I don't I'll take inventory. You, <laughs> my name is my legacy because my name belonged to my great grandmother. Oh, really? And the last time she was seen was walking into Auschwitz, holding, wow. her great grandch- holding her grandchild in her arm. And my grandfather, who I met, who survived the war, who survived Bergen Belsen, he actually was given the leichter of his mother, the Rebetzin Slavachana that was hidden before she was taken away. And that's the leichter I light every single Lal Shabbos. Wow. That's, that's yeah. meaningful. That's so, probably very emotional, no? It is. It is. But it's it's empowering too. Because every time I light the licht, I remember who I am. I remember my name. I know where I've come from. And as my Zayda said it, to us and told my mother when she was a little girl and he got this leichter, Hashem is giving us a message from the ashes. Always light a candle, even in the biggest darkness, never give up. Because one of the survivors of the town of Nadivar went back after the war to see if he can find family. He looked for my great grandfather, who was the chief rabbi of the town, my great grandmother, everyone was gone. And this was the only thing that the Germans didn't find. It was hidden in the ground, and I have it today. And now it's in Lawrence, New York. Now it's in Lawrence, Maybe New I York. Maybe I will refer to you as Slavi <laughs> after hearing that whole background. Do you, know, to it. do you know where the name originates from? Who is? It was my great grandmother, but. You don't know any further. Each of us was given a name of somebody who didn't make it, you know, in the war in the Holocaust. So th- this was our legacy. Like, you know who you are. You know that you have a purpose in this life. You have meaning. We never even were given English names. And my mother told me that when I was born and she gave me my name, Slava Khana, okay, the nurse came in for the birth certificate. That's what they would do then. My mother gave her the name and the nurse said to her, dear, I will come back when you're feeling better. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> My mother said, no, this is her name. That's it. And be proud of it. So we have were always ever, given this idea. Have you ever like been traveling and and someone asks your name and look for a, a substitution to love you? I n- just, no. no it's, it you know, what, people tell me they love the name. You yeah. know, this is one of the things that has given me purpose in life because it, really it's beautiful. a reminder. And it's my story. So I, I've been watching tons of videos of you on YouTube, and I, I encourage everyone to check them out. They're great. Thank and, you. And from what I understand, your 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 parents were very into the, one's background, the the legacy, where where you come from. Well, why do you think that was so important to them? Because we are a chain, my family in particular, and Am Yisrael. Okay, but our family, we trace our roots back to David Hamelach. And in Hungary, before the war, there were 85 rabbis with the name Young Rice who were killed. So this is who we are. You survived this? It's not that we were known as survivors, but we triumphed over this evil. 
And who we were is so linked to who we are today because it's our roots. And when you have roots, if you know where you've come from, you know where you're going. We grew up in North Woodmere at that time. I mean, it wasn't like today, okay? <laughs> Hungry Harbor. Hungry Harbor Road. And nobody heard of North Woodmere. To make a machitza, to make a shul, blood, sweat, and tears. To have a minion. My father would knock on doors. I remember he would promise orange juice and Stelladora cookies if you come. He'd call it Millionaire's Club. Stelladora. Yeah. They all still work nowadays. <laughs> yeah. still, I okay. mean, it was so much sacrifice. Every night I'd hear my father calling people, could you come to Minion in the morning? Come to the Millionaire Club. I, Shabbos. I mean, it was so much Masira Snefesh. And it wasn't done that we felt deprived of anything. We were proud of who we were. We knew that we were part of this incredible home where we were building something. So it gave us purpose and meaning. It was a great way of growing up. My, my bar mitzvah was actually, my party was in that shul. Oh, there you go. <laughs> it's a beautiful shul, it right? Is. It our started out in our basement, or Torah. Yeah. How does it feel like, it's pretty impressive that your, your parents started it with no one really there. And then you kind of look at it today. It's like a very thriving and it's beautiful community. Community, community as a whole. And yes. everyone knows that our Torah was started by your parents. Yeah. I mean, I, I hope it's it's Rabbi Young Rice Way is the name of the street. Oh, is it? Yes, because after my father was Nifter, my father was a chaplain in the police department. He had his Leviah. The police were lined up. They even flew over at that time with a missing man formation. And they named the street Rabbi Young Rice Way. That's respect. To give, yes, that tremendous respect. When my father was in the hospital, the the lieutenant would come to visit him. And I remember him saying to us, I've never met a man such as your father, the rabbi. He was known for his goodness, for his sweetness. And my parents were partners in this, you know? Right. This was their life. It's interesting. So, I think that yeah. maybe most people in the world know your mother. Like, global. Everyone knows your mother. Maybe not everyone knows your father, but he's someone but who demanded so much respect. True. He earned so much respect. And you know how my father would introduce himself to people? I'm the husband of Rebbitz and Young Rice. <laughs> and that takes a strong and confident man. Yeah. but it, It's it, a smart it, man also. <laughs> no, I, I totally hear what you mean with the confident because it sounds like he did, he, I mean, I, I read about it, he did a lot of things to he, change the huge, community and the world. Huge, huge. Was he was a brilliant Rav who had tremendous heart and soul. You know, when we were sitting shiva for my father, people were coming in. This little girl came in crying and she said, who's going to do my homework with me? I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> she was a little girl taken out of public school, put into yeshiva in North Woodmere, and she couldn't do it. Her parents didn't know anything. They did it because of my parents. My father would do homework with her every night. We had no idea. Wow. He, he, we called him the gentle giant. That's how he was known. Because yeah, he was six foot two. Oh, he was? Six foot that's, two. That's where the, my mother that's where was the wolves petite. get their height. Yeah. It's, come but on. He, was, he was the most gentle, wonderful human being. And he was a partner with my mother in everything. My mother looked up to him. She would ask him advice. And they would, you know, with each other, they would give each other strength. And they would give each other wisdom. My father came as an orphan. He lost everyone, everyone in the war. So my mother was a young rice, and my father was a young rice, hmm. but they didn't know each other before the war. I guess distant cousins. Distant cousins. And my, when my father came here and he was all alone, he looked for another young rice, and that's how he found my really? mother. Yeah. Well, he was looking for a young rice just to just, find he family. He needed family. He needed family. Well, I guess he found family. He found more <laughs> than family. Right. That's <laughs> right. So amazing. Wow. Yeah. So so we I, I had told Nachi before, like we want to talk about you and what you're up to, but obviously also there's there's so much to talk about, like your mother and, and what she, she did. So I, I don't know, where, where do we even start with your mother? Well, when my mother came here, she saw a spiritual Holocaust after going through a physical Holocaust. So even as a young girl, she never could be silent. She would get the kids on the block to comfort Shabbos, these real American kids who had no idea what Shabbos was. And then in 1973, she began Hineni, which was really one of the first, the first outreach organization in the world. And people thought, this is you know, wild. Why are you reaching out to other people? You know, 
They never heard of such a thing. Did she get like additional pushback because she was a lady? Or, well, or? she went. She went for brachas first with my my grandfather, my Zayda, to Rav Moshe Feinstein, mm. to the Satma Rav, to Rav Henkin, and each one gave their bracha that she could begin Hineni. Wow. And then she soared. And that bracha lasted with her all her life. She was tremendously successful all over the world. I mean, there's a 600-page book about her. Yes, written the Rebbitson from Art Scroll yes. that Bayer just well, came out. It's unbelievable. And I need yeah. to pick it up. You suggested that we read it before. I'm like, it's very <laughs> large, but I definitely want to pick it up Over and read Pesach, it. you yeah, have yes. what to do. Yes, yes. 100%. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so one of the things I saw was, I think this connects to Hineni, your mother, did the, I think twice, got so many people together in Madison Square Madison Garden. Madison Square Garden. That's like the flagship. <laughs> All Hineni. types of Jews. It, it was a revolution. Well, we had Amari no Sotomayor before in Madison Square Garden. <laughs> so now your mother you, Madison. Okay, here you go. Amari even, okay? Amari people, filled the Madison Square Garden in different ways. But, but not like this. No, not like, not this. like this. I was there, front row. I can tell, and take it's us something yeah. I will I never forget. I want to hear about the prep also. She filled I mean, there was, Madison Remember, there was no social media at the time, okay? It's just word of mouth, some ads. I mean, she didn't so have what, an organization at what that was time. Her, what was her goal with, I guess, that particular event? And, and goal, what was her, the process like making that happen? So her goal was to wake up world Jewry. Her her goal was to wake up Jews here. My mother would say, you're sleeping. We're sleeping. You know, we have to wake up. What does it mean to be a Jew? At that time, there were a lot of Jewish kids in cults, Jews for J. I I mean, I could tell you stories about that that you wouldn't believe. Erev Pesach... My mother brought home a young girl from a cult, okay, from Jews for J, from another state. And she got her out. She was the head of Jews for J at the time. She lived with us. They were so angry, Jews for J. So imagine this. There's a ring at the door. I remember it like yesterday. I bring a package up to the kitchen. We opened it up. We thought it was a gift. They sent the head of a pig. Whoa. Wow. As a threat. That's scary. To our family. You should have wrote a letter like it's almost Pesach. We need the head of a lamb, <laughs> not a pig. <laughs> I mean, it, that's, it took that's... a lot of courage. It How old took you a lot you, of courage. You, you like saw that. I was like 10, that's 11 scary. years were you, old. Were you scared? Were your parents no, scared? We, no. You Unfazed. know what? I only saw courage when I was growing up. Hmm. My, my they, parents they were afraid only horse. one th yeah my parents were only afraid of Hakadosh Baruch that was it if you know you're doing the right thing you have the strength and you do it and they had so much conviction and meaning in their life that there's nothing to be afraid of my father burned it with the chametz <laughs> that was it <laughs> probably smelled really bad you know? <laughs> that, that, that was it you know yeah, wow. no fear no fear because yeah there was so much loss and they started all over again so what's there to be afraid of? Right. So Drury at that time was not, I mean, not, it, a, not awoke. It wasn't... Uh... There, there were kids constantly coming through our home who were... My, my parents took them out of so much. Right. You know, the cults at the time. They would come to my grandfather, to my Zaidi for a bracha. And you can see the Jewish heart just melt away. You could see that in every Jew. And this is what my parents believed. This is how we grew up. We knew that there's a spark inside of every Jew. You just have to ignite it. It's We're one family. It's interesting, you know, and it's probably we'll, we'll continue to talk about that in Madison Square Garden and that process. And this might tie into more of what you do and, and, and when you do it. But we once did a podcast with someone over Yontov Glazer. And a lot, of, a lot of the talk was about Kirov and, and how much easier it was to be Makar of someone back then than it is now. Because then... If you just like, you know, show them to show them the spark. People wanted they wanted something, and now it's like people are jaded. There's so much out there. It's that where where there's an overflow of info, and now it's just harder to connect them. I'll tell no? you something. What do you it's think? Not, it's it's not just people. It's all of us. Mm -hmm. And I never look at it as Kirov, and we never called it Kirov mm -hmm. or outreach. It's just extending a hand to family, and. The different couples and people that I have studied with the past 25 years have truly become my family. We're connected. 
We celebrate together. We cry together. We, I know their children. I study with their children. We, we share everything because it's not just, oh, I'm trying to do outreach. It's, it's not how I look at it at all. I look at it as there's another Jew and we're family. So what do you do for family? What do you not do for family? You know? Right. And even in the firm world, I think it's very hard today, just as you were saying, you know, not to be jaded. There's yeah. so much, you know, technology and, and we have so much. So to be a spiritual person in today's world is not so easy. It's work. All of us have the same type of challenges and struggles. That's what I've discovered. It doesn't matter the country I'm in and it doesn't matter the background you have. Everyone has a challenge and a struggle. So I, I want to take it back to Madison sure. Square Garden. Yes. Um, and we'll get back to outreach or what, however, family building, family building like that. <laughs> family um, so, connection. So, what, for for how old were you at that point? I must have been like ten, eleven. Like, what was going through your head? Like, your mother's there, your father's there, just speaking to a full. I mean, there were thousands of people to the point that they had to put them on the floor, and the head of security came backstage before my mother came out and said, "You know, we're we're turning away thousands of people." My grandfather was there. With my mother, my grandfather would always give a brach, and my mother said, I'm, we can't. And my grandfather, my Zayda said, you, you can't. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. The whole conversation's in the book, but basically at the end, my mother got them <laughs> to be able to say, okay, on the floor. So thousands of people. So from, 18, 20,000 people? That's insane. Yeah, insane. And the, it's dark. It's pitch black. There's this long stage. Behind my mother was a band of yeshiva guys, okay, playing mm -hmm. Shema Yisrael. And then all of a sudden, spotlight on, and there's my mother. And she says, you are a Jew. She spoke for over an hour. You did not hear a whisper. People were crying. I mean, and at the end, the garden exploded, exploded. There was music, you know, Shema Yisrael, and men dancing with men and you know with everything with sneas with kavod with respect and dignity and people's hearts just opened that night it was watching a miracle and you really saw the power of one person to make a difference in this world and the power of a soul that every one of us has it's so crazy why didn't i know about this growing up like this is such a wild <laughs> story she, no just, yeah how'd she like how'd no she draw one could that do many it people? today how i you, you do it, it? I, I believe that it was, and, and this is what we were always led to, you know, as growing up, we knew Zechos Avos. You know, we come from a very great, great Baal Mofes, whose name was the Menuchas Asher. Mm. Till today, people go to his caver, the Chenga Rebbe. And generation after generation after generation, we've really seen what Zechos Avos is. And it's the Masorah. So if you want to do something for Am Yisrael, you have to know that Hashem will help you. And Zechus Avos is there with you. Don't be afraid. If your heart's in the right place, you can, you can wake up a nation. And I've seen it with my own eyes. You witnessed it. I witnessed it. And then from there, my mother was invited to speak to the IDF. Hmm because they thought when they saw the pictures of my mother with a microphone that she was an entertainer. <laughs> so they invited like what, her like, to like Joan come. Joan Rivers type of? No, a singer. Oh, okay. They thought she was a, a singer. So they invited her to, to come to the troops. And my mother thought, amazing, they want me to speak about Truva. <laughs> and They're she comes <laughs> out and she took a band too. That's a whole other story. And she starts in Hebrew, Hincha Yehudi. And she feels something's not right when she looks at their faces. But by the end of the night, these brave, strong chayalim, you see tears. And I was with my mother on so many of those occasions where she spoke afterwards for the paratroopers, for you know the, the Navy, for the Army. I traveled with my mother to Lebanon during the war with Lebanon well, to give chizuk to the could troops. You, could you walk us through that? I That's mean, wild. that was... Wild. We had an army jeep, okay, take us into Lebanon itself, Beirut, during the war. 
I have pictures because nobody would believe it. Right. <laughs> really, you wouldn't believe it. And the soldiers at the time, the Chayalim, as we're going into Beirut and there's traffic jams of people trying to get out, so they bypass them. We're going over mountains to find the Chayalim. And they told me to actually go under the seat so that nobody can see me sitting there because it's so dangerous that you could just have somebody walk over to the Jeep and pull you out if they see a young girl. Yeah. Could you imagine that? And we pull up and these Chayalim do not understand like, who are you? And, what and what is you this? <laughs> why are you here? They're in these tents in the field fighting for their lives. And there we come up and my mother has cards with different tefillos on them. And she tells them, you are fighting for Am Yisrael, for Eretz Yisrael. Don't be afraid. And you see these brave, strong chayalim really start to cry. I'll never forget it. We went to the hospitals after, to the hospitals of the chayalim who are recuperating. I mean, every neshama was touched in ways that I can't describe to you. It's the most beautiful thing to see. What would your what would your your mother's what would Robertson Young Rice's I guess response or reaction be to COVID? To COVID, you know, for years before my mother was Nifteris, she was saying, "I'm telling you, since 9/11, I am telling you that things are happening, and we're sleeping. Wake up," and she would say the same thing today. You know. You can't be the same person that you were yesterday, six months ago, a year ago. And if you are, then what are we going through all this for? What are we doing? Something has to change. There's no doubt Hashem's speaking to us. I mean, I'm not a Navi, of course. I'm just a regular person. But I'm telling That's you what, what she would, would say. That's what a Navi would say, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm you telling might be blowing you what your she cover. would say <laughs> after 9-11. There were so many parallels that my mother found and so many wake up moments. You know, being woke is not a new thing. <laughs> this this was what my mother asked us to do all those years ago, for years. So I think that it's every person knows what we need to do. It's not looking at another person saying, Oh, you know what she needs to do? Do you know what he needs to do? You know what that community needs to do? It's about looking at ourselves. That's what it's really about. That's so nice. I, I I heard a wild story. I don't know if it's true. Uh oh. No no no. It's a good one. <laughs> okay. Um, that your your mother was on Air Force One. So she was going to Eretz Israel. She was going to Israel at the invitation of President Bush to be on the Holocaust Commission and to speak there. And as she was flying over Germany, the president had somebody who worked with him, under him, and he said, Rebitson, look at the radar. Do you know where you are? And first my mother didn't get what he was saying, and she said, yeah, I'm on you know, the president's plane. We're going to Israel. No, Rebitson, you are flying over Germany. And then he said, think about it for a moment, Rebitson. Here you are, a child of Bergen-Belsen, flying on the plane of the President of the United States to the land of Israel at his invitation over Germany. What a miracle that is. Yeah, that's pretty wild. Isn't that wild? That's like a lot to think about. Yeah. Her life was, she was a shooting star. Your parents were, I guess, you know, they, uh, they're very inspired by their past. They're, they, you know, they came up from the ashes. Their, their families. I always say I was born upon the, the ashes of the Holocaust. And if you think about that, here we are today. Hitler's gone. Okay. Yeah. They're all gone. And I'm carrying the name of those who perished. They're still alive. It's pretty epic. You're lighting that light there. I'm lighting that leichter. We give the names over write and over story. again. Couldn't write this, you know. I mean, it's it's an incredible it's an incredible story. This is the story of Am Yisrael, if we think about it. But uh, this is my question. Maybe yeah. you don't know the answer. But like, what what like? There's obviously a lot of people making change in Klal Yisrael. But when you think of a, a woman making such a big difference, yes. your mother's on that list at the forefront. Who's doing Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Like, what what was her, that inner strength for her that she 
or that inner voice that says, I need to do it. Like, where'd that courage come from? She, she would never sleep, okay? She said, I sleep fast. We would say, mom. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great line. You have like three hours of sleep. She had a drive. She had a passion for her people, but for family too. You know, sometimes you have a public person and the kids afterwards feel that they were overlooked. Chas v'shalom. We knew that we were loved and we were number one for our parents. But when she looked at you, she looked at your neshama. She didn't see what you were wearing. There was no judgment, you know. It was just seeing a beautiful neshama. And she knew she could reach every single person. And she did. So she had this faith, maybe because of what she went through, being a daughter of Bergen-Belsen. And, you know, when my children were little and we would go home, Friday night, what was the deal? All the kids would run into their pajamas after the meal, everyone in the basement. And after my father would say Shema, they would say, Bubba, could you tell us a story from when you were a little girl? And my mother would give them stories how she stood up and she was never, ever ashamed of who she was. She saw the Nazi guard. She would describe it to them in their fur coats. And there she was starving, covered with lice, Okay, but she never wanted to be one of them. Hmm. And that was a dignity and it was an understanding. It was a courage. It was a fire that burned inside of her. It came from my grandparents, from my great grandparents. This is what she saw growing up. And if anything, what she went through only instilled this, this passion for her people even more. She couldn't sleep if she knew that somebody was in trouble or there was a neshama that needed just a little touch. That's and amazing. it was her life. A lot of people maybe, you know, have been through that and worse and react the opposite way. It's amazing that your mother was able to captivate these moments and to capitalize on it. She learned it, I think, I believe from her from her parents because when my grandparents came here, they, I mean, my grandfather was the chief rabbi of Seged. He came here, imagine it, you have nothing. You're penniless. You don't know the language. You've lost your position. You've lost your family. I mean, they lost everyone. How do you start again? And do you know what they did? They started a yeshiva in Canarsie, Brooklyn. And my Zayda would always say, when you're in darkness, you can either cry and fall apart, or you can light a candle. Light a candle. So whatever we're going through in life now, whether it's COVID or difficulties and challenges, we have to know that you can either fall apart or you can illuminate with a candle and create light in life. And each of us listening right now has that ability. Don't doubt yourself. Everyone has something to add in this world. We'll be right back to that. Can I try that? We'll be right back. Did I say that? Who, oh, this is not here, Jacob. Go. We'll, we'll be, be right, right back, back to okay. that conversation <laughs> with Revis and Slavy Wolf. But first, we want to tell you about our friends at AMR Pharmacy. They're not just friends. They're also family. And also, Nahi once said that he bleeds AMR. I'm not sure what that means. But AMR Pharmacy, <laughs> it's do. the number one pharmacy for multiple reasons. Nahi, tell us the top five reasons why you love AMR. Go. Delivery, accuracy, professionalism, success, and hot dogs. Those are the top five reasons besides for the, of course, accuracy. No, get it, get it. <laughs> they're great. They're great. Um, like Nahi said, they're straight up. They, they are a pharmacy that's They should reliable. give out free hot dogs now, like because we did this. They should do that. That'd be a great promo and their profits would double. Okay. Free hot dogs on Sundays at AMR but Pharmacy. But AMR Pharmacy, they're, they're a pharmacy that you, you always want a pharmacy that's reliable. You yes. want a pharmacy that delivers to you we're in 2021 i was about to say 2020 we're in 2021 it's the time that when you're not feeling well or you might not be feeling well you pick up that phone yeah beep, beep, and listen and don't then, let it come to neila again and you're davening you're davening you're davening and you didn't choose amr this year right like, make right. that resolution the gates are never too close they're never closed <laughs> enough for that amr so you could either call them at 848-222-1110 or Go ahead and visit them online at amrfarmrx.com. Now, transitioning in a classy way mm -hmm. to a new friend of ours at NCSY. NCSY is doing something pretty cool this Pesach. So, uh, um, get ready, kids. It, it, it's You're saying it this Pesach, and obviously last Pesach they couldn't. But if you think of Cholamoid in New York, New Jersey, 
or maybe probably throughout the world, it's synonymous with NCSY and Six Flags Great Six Adventure. Six Flags. That's it. That's it. And NCSY is going big this year. Bigger yeah. than they ever have. Yeah, they are. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's definitely the biggest. But I just want to go back to what I was saying before. Hold on. No, really. Think of Cholamide. It's for when you're a kid. It's like one of those. It's one of the best days of the year. It's it's yontif, but you get to have fun. You could do certain types of muksa, and you go to Six Flags. All the roller coasters, all the rides, all the it, it, all the games, and like you, you know that big stuff doll. That, that you basketball don't... shot that you, it's your, it's like fixed. You're not gonna hit. The, the rim is an oval. Yeah. So stop playing. <laughs> but you still love it. But you, you still, still love it. it, and that's why you should be going to Six Flags this Chol Might. And you should be going with NCSY. Yeah. Yeah, you, um, and and this year it's a little different. You can't just go up and get tickets. You have to actually go on their website to buy it before, and we, we heavily encourage you to do that. Nah, what's the website? You go to ncsygreatadventure.com, right on the screen, but if you're listening, then listen closely. It's ncsygreatadventure.com, and guys, they're going on Tuesday. They're going on Wednesday. They're going on Thursday. Don't miss out. Kosher food menu there's there's no reason not to go. Something you that we didn't mention yet. This is a game changer. Mm. That's the worst game changer sound effect, but we'll <laughs> go with that. But the, the prices, they're cutting the prices in half. So yeah, if you're going in seven weeks from now, not going to be the best price. But with them, you get a heavy, heavy discount. And not only that, Ooh, the money more. that you're paying is going to benefit the, ama- the amazing organization, NCSY. I really love when it's things like that. Win-win-win. Obviously, win, win for win, us because they're partnering with us. Win for NCSY because they get that. Win for you because you're spending money on a Kedusha Dika Day for your kids. This, that's, it's perfect for this episode, I think. Yeah, You know, absolutely. like really good chinuch. And leave your phone in the time. car. Yes. Leave, actually, leave it at home. Are we up to that point in the... Who the knows? Probably we'll not. Sure. But leave it, in the, leave it in at home. Yeah, and and go and please, please, please go to ncsygreatadventure.com to reserve your tickets today. Today. And now back to the rest of the episode. I saw that it says in the fourth book that she wrote, it says in the beginning. Oh, she, you did homework. She Yeah, <laughs> uh, it says pause and consider who you are and why you are here. That's I, I didn't know your mother, but that seems very classic, your mother, to say and to do and... That's like her message, like live in the moment. Her message is never say madua, why, madea, what can I learn from this? Mm-hmm. What purpose can come from this? Not lama, lima, for what? For what is this difficulty coming into my life right now? Nobody wants a difficulty, but if you're going through it, at least let it be purposeful, Right? So it's not for nothing. That's really beautiful. So, so now you're you're involved with Hineni. So we, I always was. So okay. people think that only after my mother left this world, <laughs> you went to Beirut with I, her. Yeah, so, I mean, I mean come on. all the you way your back life to be part of it. Then, so I've been teaching in Hineni now, along with my siblings, but I've been teaching for over twenty five years. Wow, that's amazing. That's a lot of years. Baruch Hashem. You're oh don't even yeah twenty six <laughs> <laughs> so hey, so you've been involved with Hanani so what what have you been doing for Hanani so how did I begin when my mother years ago was writing a book she took a little hiatus to write and she asked me to give a class of hers in the Hanani building which is in the city I did there was a young girl who was in class then her mother had studied with my mother and she was there in the class she had been newly married and she said to me you know what. I love this. Would you study with my husband, myself, and we have a few friends? We began with four couples in New York City, and Baruch Hashem, we started Hineni Couples. As the couples moved to different communities or they invited friends to come, it exploded. I have to say, it just exploded, and I've met the most incredible people in my life. When they started to have children, they asked me if the Torah says anything about raising kids. (laughs) Are you (laughs) kidding me? (laughs) So that became my book, Raising a Child with Soul. It was published by St. Martin's Press. Wow. And we went from there to studying relationships. I mean, everything's in the Torah. We just don't realize it. And it doesn't matter. I, I don't look at it as someone being religious or not religious with a background, not a background. I mean... Like I said before, we all have the same struggles, right, you know? It's human. It's, it's human. human. And every, exactly. every human, you know, 
relationships are relationships and that's it parents are parents so that's h- how it. did you i guess what what was the value that you brought to the table to these couples what was what was the challenge at that time when you started with the couples how how has it evolved i think i want to start there and well i guess we'll progress through that you but, just asked like seven questions i know right <laughs> we'll pick, pick well, the challenges <laughs> are really it's really the same when you think Better about it now? what do we want we want to raise good kids we want good homes and what is good you know Here's something that I'll always ask parents, what do you want for your kids? What do you want? And what do you think the answer usually is? Like, what do you want for your Yaka, kids? What do you think the answer um, usually is? To, to, to be a, live a righteous life, to follow in the ways of Hashem. No, seriously, what like, what do you no, really very, want? I know. Okay. Um, I'm asking you as, you know. Yaka, I want, just, yeah. I want my kids want? To, to really be to able. To be what? To be themselves. To be themselves. Am I being too cliche? No. No. no, that's super real. That's wrong. I what, want them to be them. What does that mean? Meaning uh, we, we all see so many people, so many figures around us, and Hashem put us here on this world for a reason, and we all have that reason. for. Okay, day-to-day life. What do you want? Um, okay, you come home at the end of the day and you say, Definitely uh, to be on the phone less than me. <laughs> definitely to be on the phone less than me. I just want my kids to be what? Can't, don't say sleeping, okay? Oh, I don't know. Uh, to be kind, to learn Tyra, uh, okay. to be kind. Uh, I said kind. Okay, no <laughs> wrong answer. Wait, here. why are we shooting on me? Like, <laughs> Nahi, you also have a kid. My baby's perfect. <laughs> um, what do you, you know, we have dreams, we have visions. Most people say, I just want my kids to be happy. I it right. definitely, yeah, I don't want to. Happiness, wanna, yeah. that's the big okay. one, yeah. And I want more than thing. that, though. But well, here's the thing. Okay. I'll always... That's usually the number one answer. What happiness? Yeah, I just want my kids to be happy. It's super because it's like, and you know what I'll tell parents? Yeah. (laughs) Wrong answer. You know what you want? You want to give your children tools for happiness. Mm. Because if you have the tools, then they know how to overcome difficulty. Also, usually the happiness that you give to somebody is like fleeting. Like you can't ice cream. give somebody happiness. It's, it's momentarily. We think we can buy happiness, okay? So we'll just shower them with things, but they're never happy. Why there's so many unhappy kids around? And that doesn't matter. You tell me, it's why the are same there so... thing from when I started till today. If anything, I see more unhappiness. How come? How come? What do you think? Well, like You're you in just the said, there's. People are just giving more stuff and not maybe parents, giving them maybe, tools. Maybe, maybe, maybe kids just want their parents to spend time with them. And we buy, confuse buy presents, buying a present, with, with presents. Mm. Being well, a maybe Hashem shouldn't have made the same life. word, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a lot you could learn from Torah about raising happy kids. And if you think about it, if something's in the Torah, it's real. Here's a teaching that I give, and I've learned this from my mother. Okay, how do you know if something is true? It has to be in the Torah. So what's the word for fair in the Torah? You sure? That's straight. There is no fair. Okay. You know why? It's a trick question. Trick question. You couldn't have, like, come on now. I didn't answer it. You didn't have to answer that. <laughs> because there is no fair because I don't know what's fair. And we're so busy trying to make things fair. Okay, he got sneakers, so you're getting sneakers. He got four chicken nuggets, now you get four chicken nuggets. And then we measure the juice and we measure the birthday cake that everything has to be fair. But you know what? Life isn't fair. There's different circumstances. There's different gifts. And I have to zero in on every child. What does this child need? What are the tools that this child needs in order to fulfill his purpose and be happy in this world? Because when you have purpose, that's when you're happy. That's the key to happiness. When you know that you count, you're a giver. There's chios, there's life. When all you do is take, you're never happy. So babies come into this world like this. Hmm. Their fists are clenched. My job as a parent is to slowly open those fingers one by one and until a child knows, you know what? I know how to give. One of my kids, it was before Purim, and he said to me, this year, mommy, instead of just giving shalachmanas to all my friends, I want to choose one kid in the class that I know nobody's bringing shalachmanas to. He has no friends. So we drive up to this child's house. I remember it like yesterday. My son rings the bell. This boy's face, the way it lit up, I mean, you can't buy joy like that. My son runs back into the car and he says, Ma, that was better than hitting a home run Hmm. because it makes you feel that you're adding in this world. So 
as a parent, I have to figure out how to raise a child to be a giver, to be kind, not to be jealous, okay, to be compassionate, to have chesed, and at the same time to know what gift do I have to make this world into a better place. So when you speak about parenting and challenges, that's only evolved as technology has grown through the years for kids because they'll sit on a phone or play a video game for five hours or the hurt that comes through phones and texting and WhatsApps. I mean, I get calls every week from parents about kids who are just crushed from somebody's text, somebody's WhatsApp. And here's the thing. When you send a text about somebody, when you do LOL or you forward something that's hurtful, you know what happens today? That child never sees the impact of his words on the child that's hurt. So you never see the so tears. Not, it's not a healthy situation at all. It's no, like, because you're growing up. You can't even up. apologize because you, can't even, you don't even know. You don't even so. know to apologize. Now, how do you go into a relationship like that? It's so unhealthy. They, it's, they, they, I, think, I, don't, right. I didn't know the statistics. I literally just heard something. I guess that, that falls into like cyberbullying. And they're saying that the rates of cyberbullying is so much more damaging, exactly like you're saying, because you don't see what happens, and it's so much easier also to be mean or offensive. Sure. Because it's- If you're it, gonna hurt me, hurt in, me to my face. No, it's in <laughs> passing. A lot of times these people aren't trying, sometimes they're malicious, but a lot of times it's not. Kids don't realize. Yeah, and, and but people are getting hurt. Really hurt, and you never realize. When, when you hurt somebody, when you say something, and you see that their tears, you know, or their eyes glisten a little, or their face is down, Maybe you could apologize. You realize you've done something. Right. But if you've never even been confronted with the person you hurt, and now it's getting forwarded a thousand times. So how how do you become a husband, wife, parent like that? You're clueless. You're missing a big chunk of emotional and social sensitivity. So I say hurt people hurt people. Hurt people hurt people. I'd also tell you that behind anger is a lot of pain. Hmm. And there's a lot of pain in the world today. So when I teach parenting, we speak a lot about understanding what children are going through, how to bring out the best in children, how to raise children with grit, resilience, not rushing in and, and, and doing everything for the child. You know, helicopter parenting is real. It's gone from helicopter to drone parenting where <laughs> we just like zero in and, you know, we call the coach and we call the principal and we call the teacher. And, you know, I've spoken to parents who visiting day, they're rearranging everything. <laughs> so children are never allowed to, to understand yet yeah, to, to fail, to fall, to do for themselves. And what will happen when they grow up? How so, do you yeah. deal with disappointment if you've never been disappointed? What do you think the root of parents doing that? Is it like a lack of betachan? Is it a lack? In... No, I think that, first of all, we can, number one. Right, right, right. Okay. No, for sure. We can fix a lot of things for our kids, you know? Just you make the, one call to the right. principal, right? Many of our parents would never have done that. So... <laughs> The you, contrary. <laughs> you, or, okay, <laughs> but you have more power today, okay? You can buy more things for your children, and there's this thing about fitting in, you know, that you want your child to fit in. So you'll do anything. You'll deprive yourself as long as your child will have that. You'll fix it. You'll stay up till 2 in the morning doing the report, yeah. okay? You'll You'll just do it. Because you don't want your child to be left behind. You want so him Ellie in the best bunk. Ellie didn't do his reports. He didn't. Ellie, huh? <laughs> Ellie did his reports. For those listening, Ellie is her son who's friends with Nahi. Yeah. Um, so I, I want to talk to you also, and, and we'll probably get back to parenting, but you also deal with shalom bias. Shalom bias, relationships, absolutely. What's... Yeah, what's, what's your, the story? Yeah, there, what's the, are, what's there, the no, You just story? get a, a, a lot of insight into children and the parenting. Is it like similar with, with couples? Just because couples are children who grow up, you know? Couples Play, are children together. who grow up and bring a lot with them. Yeah, a lot of baggage. So the first thing you have to do is you have to realize that your home is your mikdash ma'at. And I will tell couples sometimes to ask yourself just one question and that is this 
is this worth my shalom bias? Hmm. So I give this story that years, not so many years ago, but every Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, we're in the city with Hineni. And one year, my husband went ahead of me. We stay in a hotel there, and, and we run a beautiful, beautiful davening in the hotel. So my husband went ahead, and he asked me to pack for Yom Kippur just, you know, a suit and a shirt, white shirt. It comes right before Nilo. We're, we're getting ready a little bit before my husband asked me where his, I'm sorry, before Kal Nidre, where's the shirt? And I say, oh, it's there, it's there. Anyway, I'm listening with half an ear and half an eye. I'm looking and e -e, no shirt. So my husband said, are you sure that you packed the shirt? I'm like, yeah, just look again. I go over, I start now opening the little zipper compartments, you know, maybe yeah. I will. It's not there. And it's a little tense. He's in a navy blue shirt. Okay, you cannot go to Col Nidre in a navy blue shirt. We're in the city. And we look at each other. And then I say to myself, we're in New York City. We're going to get another shirt, but it's before Yom Kippur. Like, this is not worth my shalom bias. So we go out, we get another white shirt, we make it, and that shirt, I always tell couples this story, is still hanging in my closet because that's my shalom bias shirt. Mm. And I ask you, is it worth my shalom bias? What's worth your shalom bias? We have to think about that. Is, it, is a shirt worth your shalom bias? Nothing's worth your shalom bias. So that's one thing. And, and another point that I tell couples is that gratitude is the oxygen of marriage. You know, you can do some great things for your husband, for your wife, but if you feel taken for granted, it saps the energy. You don't need anything but a smile, a thank you. Did you thank your wife today? Did you thank your husband today? Give a little bit of a smile, you know, an encouraging word, a thank you. Do something nice. Make a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, fill the car with gas. These are these little it's acts of things. love. It's the small things. It's not, it's not the big things. It's not the anniversary, the birthday presents. It's, no, it, yeah. it's the small moments every day that makes you feel that you're not living with somebody who is just seeing past you, you know? And you would do anything for your husband, anything for your wife. But give a smile, give, give a, a word of gratitude. Show that you don't take the person that you live with for granted. Sometimes, you know, the phone rings and you would give this huge hello to your friend and talk to them for an hour on the phone. But your own husband, your own wife, you know, you mumble under your, under your breath. And you can't even give them the time of day. It's, what are we doing? It's so true. It's so easy to get, I guess, you know, used yeah. to the person you're with and then sure. you like exactly like you said you the the buddy that you haven't spoken to in five years they call you with great news it's right. like oh my gosh Your it's so exciting and right. then it's right. like okay yeah. back to regular life and it's like i heard take it for granted. Said that like he doesn't one thing he's mocked but he's mocked many things in his marriage but he doesn't scream his wife's name like if he's in a different room doesn't say like Leia, like come here. Uh, I think you're gonna he, say he doesn't scream at his wife. No, <laughs> like that's what maybe, he does. Maybe does. <laughs> he doesn't. He doesn't like raise his voice. Does, he doesn't like yell her name from across. If you want, he walks up to her mm. and he'll like you know, it's something that I guess together to like treat her the, the right way and not shout from across the room and like look when you go to sleep at night. Ask yourself: Did I show my husband? Did I show my wife some type of appreciation today? Some type of affection? Something? Because it's so easy, you know, you get lost in the bills, you get lost in the kids, you get lost in work, you get lost in COVID and in worries, in, in anxiety, whatever it is. But don't let life go by and the people that mean most to you, you're so busy looking at your screen hmm. that you haven't looked at them in their eyes. And th that's another huge, huge issue in marriage that we're so busy looking at our screens. We don't have a conversation looking at each other eye to eye. There's something when you look at somebody in their eyes. That's why you don't want to do this over Zoom, right? You want yeah, somebody to come in. 100%. It, it right. makes a huge difference. Yeah. Right? Could you imagine going into a PTA and the teacher's just looking down at her screen? You know, hmm. I gave a talk once on technology to parents. So as I come up to the mic and there's a huge room in front of me, I take out my phone 
And I just start, you know, texting. And I hear people saying, like, is she kidding? Like, what is she doing? And I say, just a moment, please. I just have to answer this text. And I hear, like, mumbling. And then I said, how did that feel to you? Because that's how it feels to your kids, to your husband, to your wife, when you walk in the door and you say, just a moment, I have to just answer this text. It doesn't feel good. Everyone in that screen is more important than the person sitting across from you right here who is the love of your life. I'm definitely addicted to my phone. There's no, I'm not even like, I'm like fluffing it up i'm 100 percent no i didn't sound phone. fluffy at all <laughs> <laughs> i'm for sure and whenever we have these type of conversations it always makes me appreciate shabbos more oh that totally. like as much as addicted as i am comes shabbos it's off and i'm so much happier it's funny you Just, wrote something i think on twitter yakov that um, i don't know where you wrote it but as a kid shabbos was i guess and i, I, I resonate with me shabbos wasn't like my favorite mitzvah as a kid maybe it was looked at oh i can't do this can't do that but now as an adult shabbos is like you want it to be another day another day another day it's incredible but i have an idea for you Jakob. yeah please okay at least dinner time should be a sacred time turn off your phone i know we started that and okay. then i i, uh, I have to this no, is you your gonna, challenge i know i'm doing no, no, i'm gonna be mechazic if okay. my wife's listening to this she, she, <laughs> she doesn't listen to every episode i think we have a few thousand witnesses right now <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah okay. okay people are gonna stop me it's now, be like, life-changing hey, yeah no, i agree, I agree. Life do not text yako from six to eight o'clock like done yeah. You, one hour, one yeah. hour. Okay, you fine, know, I had a, I had a couple. Wait, hold on. You said me. dinner, and now you're going one hour. Which one no, is it? No, dinner's an hour. Dinner's an hour. Oh wow, it is. Yeah. It's shorter or longer for you? I, your mother, is, you know, she would sleep quickly. I eat quickly. <laughs> okay, so now you could stretch it out. <laughs> well, okay, okay. So as long as you're at the table, listen. I had a couple come to me, and and the father said to me, "I don't understand it. I got these amazing tickets for a game. This was pre-COVID. Okay, you know, I took my son to the best basketball game." I, best seats in the house. The only thing he said to me the whole time was, Dad, could I have your credit card? I want to buy a Coke for myself. I mean, and I said to him, I'm not going to be hurtful to you, but I'm going to ask you something and tell me the truth. All these years, okay, he's a teenager now, but all these years, you were with him in the car, you were with him at dinner, whatever you did, were you on your phone? Because if you were on the phone, then he thinks that that's normal not to talk when you're together. Because oh, wow. that's the new normal. That's crazy. That's crazy, but it's the truth. <sighs> it's so hard to get out of it, though. Let me ask you a question. Well, I, w- I want to, I guess, go back. I think like parenting and relationships are all the same because, I mean, like parenting kids is a become, relationship. No, but yeah, kids it's become fun. parents, you know? So Yeah, well, you're living with another person. Right. And it takes sacrifice. So when I was, I was in camp, Camp Monk, for 15 years. Me and your son, Ellie, were bunkmates for all those years. Good friend. Um, and I, something to that point that you brought up a little bit earlier, as I was in camp and there was like this kid singing in the choir and he, he like forgot the words. Okay. And it was like the the worst. (laughs) The air got sucked out of the room. He's up there and it was like, everyone wanted to like bury themselves and he like fell flat on his face and, and it was like, I couldn't imagine a worse situation. And I saw him like four weeks later, but like the Camp Long Circus, that same kid was up there again and he, he had a solo and he nailed it. And like, to me, I was thinking like in my mind, he, he got so much higher than he ever could have gotten, you know, had he not f- fallen originally, meaning if he didn't fall originally, he would never attain the level he did after ha- having fell and having messed up and then succeeding courage. But my how gosh. many times, meaning it was camp. There was no parent to say, okay, pause everyone. Right. It was camp. So in camp, when you're in that environment where it's hands off and kids are there to be themselves and you know, it is what it is. So you fall and they get up. And I think that's why for me, at least the two months during the summer, the impact on my life was way more than the 10 months during the year. But how do you replicate a a scenario where kids can grow all year? You know, is that by telling parents like, let your kid fall? My wife always tells me my baby's crying. Let's not like when she was young, when she was four months, let's not go in right now because she needs to cry this out. She needs to know this is life. Right. So I would I would tell the parents listening now, no matter the age, don't rush in. See if you can give even a word of encouragement instead of doing it for them. Okay? You know, you have a child struggling with a puzzle piece or trying to use a fork. 
you know, that we're trying to hold that cheerio. I'm talking first for the littlest ones. Clap for the child, applaud the child, encourage the child, but then don't rush in to fix it for them. We fix everything so quickly. And as children get older and they say, oh, I can't and it's impossible. Sure, it's much easier for you to just do it for them. Who wants to hear that, right? But instead, you can, and I'm here for you. I'll make you a delicious hot cocoa, okay? I'm right in the room next door. I'm happy to hear. I'm happy to look at it when you're done. Instead of just rushing in and fixing it, you know, look at the little things. A child comes and says, ugh, I'm bored. There's nothing to eat in this house. Instead of just saying, oh, no, you could do this, this, and this. You could eat this, this, and this. Well, if you're bored, what do you think you can do? Right. All right? There's it's nothing sort of like to eat Hashem if you're hungry. Yes. And we're supposed to emulate Hashem, but Hashem doesn't fix our problems. The tools are all around us. And he says, go ahead and do it. Tools are huge. Grit is huge. Who are the kids who make it in life? Who are the ones who make it? The kids it's with grit. Not the kids with grit. <laughs> it's okay. yeah. so smart. <laughs> I know. You know. You teach at Hanini. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the kids whose parents did everything for them because once they go out into the Those world, they don't know how to make a phone call. Yeah. They don't know how to make a phone call. It's amazing. I was speaking somewhere out of town in Palm Beach, actually, and the rabbi there quoted, they had the CEO of Home Depot. He'd spoken to the Hebrew school there. And he said, it was amazing. He comes in, this huge CEO of a company, he says to them, I feel really sorry for all of you. And they're looking at each other and he says, because you're all disabled. Like, we're not disabled. He said, you're all disabled because you go through life with half an eye and only using one hand. Your other hand is holding a phone and you're always just looking down. You're all disabled. You know how I became who I became? Because I was present. I used my eyes, I used my ears, I used my hands, I was always present. You're always looking and thinking about something else that's on your screen. And you think about that. It's, in, it's inevitable though, no? Like how do you, this is where we're at. Like this is 2021, the screens to, to you know, to our advantage and to our disadvantage. Right. It so brings us a lot, to, but also- So use it, so I would tell you this. Parents today, first of all, like we said, be present. Really be honest with yourselves. Every time you're in the car, do you need to be on the phone? Like find some pocket Stop of time. Stop listening to this podcast. <laughs> like, just shut it off and ask your kid. Repeat after me. How was you your know day? What? When you're with your child, choose a time. If it's story time with a younger child, don't read a story with the phone. If it's dinner time, don't sit at the table. Of course, we're all human. I'm human too. We're not going to just, you know, throw it all away but at least create what I call a sacred space, a sacred time that you know it's just you and this child, you and your spouse for at least that block of time. Don't walk into the house all the time looking at your phone, okay? And allow your child to make mistakes. It's not the end of the world. Could you imagine if you'd never let your child get rid of the training wheels? Okay, and they're always with training wheels and you're always holding on. It would look and pretty weird, yeah. <laughs> every time your toddler's trying to walk, you go, oh my gosh, he's falling, go catch him. He's like, mom, no. 20, stop it. <laughs> you know? It's right? sort of like that analogy with like the caterpillar. If if you go ahead and when the caterpillar is trying to break out of a cocoon and you and you cut it open for it, you know, it, it, tried, it spreads the wings, but people don't realize that a butterfly, in order to be able to fly, it needs to go through that process of breaking out to build the muscle. So you cut open the cocoon for this caterpillar, and then it's just limping. And you're like, wait, I did it a favor. But no, you just you just pa- paralyze the thing for life because it needs to go through that difficulty to, to fly. Yes. And no one's looking for difficulties. And I'm not saying to look for challenges to. and difficulties, <laughs> okay? But right, life happens. Life happens. And when life happens, you don't want to, God forbid, be the one who falls apart or has a child who falls apart. You want your child to know that your love is unconditional. You're there for them. And we will make it through this. We will do this. Okay? You're not alone. I'm here with you. But I can't eat for you. I can't breathe for you. And you're going to have the tools to make it through this. You can do this. Tefillah is a big deal, too. To have children understand the power of prayer of tefillah is huge. And I don't know if we give that over enough to our kids. There's so much fear in the world today. We have so many tools that we're given and we just have to dig in. Every child has a gift. 
I've seen it with my own eyes. It's how you see the child. So you could either see a child as like, oh my gosh, they're like out of control. You could see a child with tremendous spirit. Now, what are we going to do with the spirit? Don't try to change your child into who he is not, but use that force to create some type of magic in this world that the child knows I'm here and I can do something to make this world into a better place. I mean, the world would be a better place if people were, you know, brought up like that. If more people were brought up like that, that's yeah. amazing. That's Think like what that would do for your kids, for healthy, all our healthy kids. Healthy people. Yeah. Healthy Every people kid doesn't have to be the people. same. <laughs> healthy know. people, healthy people. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we think, oh, you know, this child's too shy. Okay. It could be a gift. What do we do with that? With that gift? Look at every character trait as a gift. And what can we do to bring this gift out? It's interesting you're saying that the first thing that's popping to my mind, I'll be super honest. Uh, okay. This whole discussion. Super is, honest is good. Is, Lego. <laughs> that's the first thing that's popping to my mind. Lego, right? Loves Lego. Mine is Wells Fargo. <laughs> like, what's up with that? Um, okay, what type thing. of name is that? But the second thing that's popping to my mind is is like Rebeam. Okay. Like that's like that's the first thing that just came came to me. That S- grew up spent a lot of time in Yeshiva. Yes. And I think a lot of what you're saying is like does this exist in the classroom? Does could, it? Can it exist? Does it? Do I mean, you remember it? this? I, th- I mean, I hold on. I mean, we some go through our experiences. Yeah, this, obviously <laughs> certain rabbeim are better than others, but for sure, the good rabbeim are the ones that made you right, feel geschmack right. when you got that answer or or like brought out whatever your your chush was. I, I, my point is like, but there's, again, there's 25 kids in a class. It's not easy. Lakewood, it's, it's, 35. So, it's so, so difficult. <laughs> what it's are you supposed difficult to, do? to be. They, what are they supposed to do? It's I'm not, it's so difficult. I don't think people appreciate how hard it is to be a good mora, to be a good rebbe. But I also think that if you would take a second right now, all of us, we could each think of one teacher that made a difference in our life. Should one more, yeah, one Rebbe. Your Everyone can think of somebody. Now, could you imagine if after this podcast, we each try to find that Rebbe or Mora and just sent them a note or a word? I'm going to do it. I'm yeah. gonna, I, 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 I have to think about it. There's a bunch of Rebbeim, but I'm, I'm going to We have a few Rebbeim, definitely in my mind. It's like, because You're going to also do it. I'm going to make you do it. If everyone listening yeah. right now would do that. It's a movement. Do you know what that does? It I creates, mean, it, it, like, I don't know. You pay it forward because it lets a Rebbe or Mora or teacher know, you know what? It's been 10 years. It's been five years. It's been 20 years. And they never forgot me. I, I can make this difference. It, it's so, so fun, true because yeah. I'm like on a chat with my friends. I'm on this chat when I'm not during dinner, obviously. And <laughs> and we always reminisce about like, you know, the, obviously the funny times and good times, but we, we do call back to like, wow, remember when that, that Mora did that or a teacher did that or that Rebbe did that? Or camp, and, you know? Yeah. yeah what the memories counselors. you have, counselors or Rebbeim from camp or camp directors that, you know, that imprinted something in our hearts and our souls. So sure, we could think about the ones who maybe stifled a child or right. made a child feel bad, but let's look with the positive eye and reach out to somebody. It's life-changing. When I was in high school, I went to shoot for Rockway, my, my English principal. You also did it already, a goal grab. And he, was, he happened to also be my sixth grade Rebbe. And I think I was in 10th grade and we were going through something... It was Dick Duck. And I, I was like, um, I was like nailing. I was like really good at it. And, and my Rebbe said to me, like, where do you learn such good Dick Duck? I said, a sixth grader. My goal grab was like, <laughs> he taught it to me. I wasn't even thinking about it. I just said it. And I, I went I went down to lunch. My goal guy came over to me. I'm like, oh gosh, like, what, what I do? <laughs> what I do? <laughs> what I do now? <laughs> right. And, and he came over to me and, he, and he's, he like asked me to come to his office. I went to his office. I said, okay, like what I, I'm thinking through all the things that I did the last 36 hours. And he said to me, he's like, I appreciate it. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, your Rebbe told me that in sixth grade, you knew because of my class. So we're all human. And for me as a 10th grader, it's funny. I was like, like, he appreciates that. Sure. And of course he does. And, now, and, now, like, and, and by now the way, you're it, in detention. Take, it, <laughs> take it to marriage now. Wow. Okay. Right. Take it to marriage. Thank you for Shabbos. Thank you for taking the kids. I mean. You know, I once had a couple and they, they were having real shalom bias issues. We were talking about it. And and one of them said, "What well, I have to say thank you for everything. It's like, you know what? It, it doesn't even cost you anything. Mm, right. Okay? And for the other person, it's so meaningful. 
to be able to express that appreciation and know that you're valued and cherished. And what is it? What does it take to say a thank you? It's so true. I I, I we I know we could talk about this for another four hours. Definitely. I do want to like okay. finish off before we ask you our. Baselines. Call them fun questions. Call them okay. Uh, like baseline baselines. It's like baseline vitals. You know, you take someone's blood pressure. In my pharmacy. <laughs> so so um, I want to ask you about, okay, so you put me in touch with one of your Chavrusa students. I'm not a student. Okay, one of your students that you've been teaching, learning together with for my over. My class is 20, over 20 years. Over 20, 20 years. Yeah. And I spoke, I, I won't say her by name, but I, I spoke to her and she's someone who, who, by label, we were talking. I was talking to her. I'm like, it doesn't sound like you're, you know, by label, like fully, fully, fully religious. But she was one of the most from or spiritual, authentic, authentic right? people I've ever spoken to, and it was very interesting to me that like whenever someone I, you know, I hear they're involved in Kirov, it's usually okay Kirov and and outreach, but it didn't like you were referencing this before in in the intro. That it's not really about that. It's about just getting connection. To, yeah. So, like, what are you? What are you doing practically? Like, different. What am I doing with the couples that I teach? Different. Yeah, with the, these people, the people that that, that, that person that I spoke to. That like she has that connection to you. She was talking about any mitzvahs that she does or her connection with right. Hashem. Well, what's the secret sauce? I think what I what I tell the people that I study with that we study together with is everything. Number one is found in the Torah. Okay, so I'm going to give you the MS. I'm going to give you the truth. And what you do with it is up to you. I, do, I never judge anybody that I study with, okay? And they really do become a part of my life. You know, I love their children. <laughs> I study with their kids now. <laughs> their joys are my joys. Their sorrows, I, I feel inside of me. It's just, it's it's... Can I say this? It's not sappy, but it's real. Like I really love the families that I teach. And they have given me so much, I, I could say, inspiration and passion for studying, for learning. So there's this soul connection. Does that answer your question? Yeah, a yeah, bit? No, totally. totally. It's totally. not thought of like a sheer or a class. It's a way of life. And I want to give that over to them. And when I see each of them taking a little step in any direction, for me, it's an incredible feeling. That's really beautiful. If you can sit down with anyone in history, it's no longer alive. It could be back from Osher Rabbeinu. It could be someone who passed away four years ago. Spend an hour with them and talk with them. Wow. Who would it be? I think I would love to sit down with Esther Hamalka. Hmm. Okay. Why, why Esther Hamalka? Because so much of her life was hidden and she was a heroine, but so under the radar and she must have suffered so much in the palace of Ahasuerus. There's a lot we don't know about her. I'd love to know what gave her that courage every single day to just keep on going and fighting for Am Yisrael when she was restricted in her own life and couldn't live with her people. What would you say is the worst advice that you've ever received? Me? Yeah, you. The worst re advice I yeah. ever received? Wow. I don't know if I've ever gotten bad advice. Really? I mean, it's it depends who you ask advice you. to. Huh? You ask not, a everyone lot of ask, not everyone you ask advice for is the only people giving you advice. Plenty no, of people give like, advice. You, you, we spoke about a few characters in this podcast that are people that are aren't Maybe they don't get it, or they're not conducive, or they're just spoiling their kid. Like you know, in life, we 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 encounter people that, you know, it's not, sometimes it's not like authoritative uh, figures. Yeah. Right. I'm sure that when I leave here, I'm going to think of a lot of bad advice right. I got in like my life. Past you know, to Haluteman, and someone said, "Don't eat the shawarma." Right. It's terrible advice. Um, I'm, I'm sure what, I'll think of something. What's, what's, what's the best? Advice? You know what? I what's have to tell advice? you something. I really try. I'm not always successful, but I try to to th remember good things. Hmm. So maybe that's why. <laughs> yeah, well, what's, 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 what's the, the best advice? The ever best received? advice I ever got was when I was asked to write my book, Raising a Child with Soul, and sign it with St. Martin's Press. I was pretty scared. Okay, I never wrote a book before. Mm -hmm. And 
to sign a contract with you wrote a lot of reports for ellie in high school but Uh, (laughs) (laughs) um a a secular company also right it was it was it was scary and my mother said just go for it (laughs) and that was great advice she said just go for it hashem will will help you you'll have the words just go for it and that was one of the best pieces of advice i ever gave because fear doesn't allow you to accomplish in your life. And how much more would we each accomplish if we just put fear aside and we seize the moment? Probably a lot. You ever ask yourself, Yaakov or Mrs. Wolf, like... Robinson Wolf. Robinson yeah. Wolf. No, okay, I'm kidding. I don't know. Robinson she... Slubby. If, uh, <laughs> oh, Robinson com- Slubby. That's good that's, Yeah, that's what... Yeah. Okay, you're going to trademark that's a that good now, one. aren't you? Okay. It's going to be on a sweatshirt. <laughs> it's going to be on a Thank You Hashem sweatshirt next week. <laughs> Um, but like if, if, if fear didn't exist in your life, what would you be doing? Like if fear didn't exist in I know in the life, answer to this. She'd be what's doing your what she's, answer, yeah. She'd what's, be doing what she's doing right now. Yeah. Yeah. If fear I, didn't exist. I'd is there be, anything you'd be doing do with right now? Like, I'd be going I think traveling more across the world. Are you scared of traveling or just Well you can't. You used right. to before COVID, you used to travel. Yeah. Yeah. Everywhere. I mean, everywhere. And it hurts. South Africa, right? South fear. Africa S- to the Sinai and Daba. Thousands and thousands of yeah, people. Yeah, those are incredible. The most unbelievable community. South Africa is the most open-hearted, beautiful community. So that's for Lawrence, of course. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but to be exotic. I mean, yeah. three times to speak for, you know, 5,000 people. It's amazing. It's, it's, it could be fearful, but... Then you overcome it and you just, you go because you have passion. Is it scary to speak in front of 5,000 people? Like, do you get nervous? Is there jitters? If, if you say you're not nervous before, then you've reached a place of arrogance. <laughs> That's Yes, I like that. What do you do with those nerves? How do you like, keep it under control? Hashem yeah? Over and over again. And then you go out and I'll tell you something. If you believe in yourself, meaning you believe in your message, you believe in your purpose, you can do anything. That it's not even you. Seriously, you separate it's yourself. Not me. It doesn't it's reflect not me. on me. It reflects on the message. No. I was the it's most you, shy Hashem. kid <laughs> growing up. I couldn't even say hello. Really? To a oh my gosh. Yes. Interesting. My parents were like, what are we going to do with this girl? <laughs> but Let's throw her in front of 5,000 people at signing down. <laughs> Let's take her to a war in Lebanon. I think that will get her <laughs> that out would of do her it, right? Listen, whatever happens, happens. <laughs> I'm telling you and anyone listening you know, believe in your sense of purpose and mission in this world because it allows you to overcome whatever fear you're facing. And it doesn't have to be going to another country and speaking for 5,000 people. It could be something in your own private life that you're just afraid. Yeah, sure. It could be ordering dinner. You know, uh, how? How? Yeah. People have a fear of of, of like, ordering dinner. <laughs> One well, second, I'm sure people are scared. Maybe. One second, no. nah, <laughs> stick to your caterpillar. <laughs> no, people, you don't think people are scared to like walk up to? <laughs> yeah, I hear that. People are scared of people, people interaction, hear, communication. Yeah. You know, okay, that's fair. That's people fair. have a really lot. Of, like, people yeah, have a lot of fears that you deal with in life, or you don't deal with it. We're, we're going to finish on on one okay. last question. I don't know if we ever finish on this question, but we will. Uh, there are 613 mitzvahs. Okay. Is there one mitzvah in particular that has a special place in your heart? One mitzvah in particular. You know, that's like asking who's your favorite child. And hey, well, that's the next question. <laughs> yeah, actually. We, should we just skip this one and go to that one? Or? Because I think every mitzvah is really linked to the next. So if I'd have to choose one on top of my list, I think it would be my tefillah to Davin. Because... I can't go a day without my morning, especially my morning davening, and then that just opens up the gates for me to learn. I, I love to I love to prepare for my classes. I love to find out new thoughts and ideas and wisdoms. I mean, the Torah is so rich. Before my Zaidi left this world, he asked to be carried to his svarim shank, to the bookcase that held all his svarim, and. He kissed each safer goodbye. Oh, and wow. he said, These are my best friends. It's so hard to say goodbye. And we shall that's how I that grew up. To, to, that, be, to be able to say that. That that was that's life, you know. So I think that every mitzvah is a gateway to the next. It's all linked together, connected. Well, Robertson, Mrs. Slubby Wolf, <laughs> thank you for spending the time with us. Thank you for the invite. I really appreciate it. And you should both have a tzlacha. I know you 
touch a lot of souls with your podcast. Thank thank you. you. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. You're welcome. And did you, Nak, let me ask you a personal question. Do you ever listen to these episodes? Uh, No, not really. Really? I don't listen to them. Maybe sometimes I'll watch them. Um, But I I, I don't listen to them. Okay, not listen, but you watch them. Some some of them, I would say maybe twenty five percent of them. I watch. So I either watch or listen to them if like I just want to, you know, kind of go over a few edits, or if I'm, you know, showing it to my wife. I always cringe whenever I talk. On, on That's why it. I don't listen. That's why I don't listen. Like my my wife, like when we're in the car, she always wants. To, I say you go listen when you're driving. I'm not listening to me. I'm not listening to myself talk. <laughs> I have to be myself. It's also weird. Like Matt, I always try to tell people like. Imagine having a conversation and then re-listening to that conversation, even if it's like a great Would conversation. Would you say that, Lashon Hara? Is it worth it? It's not worth it. Not worth uh, it. But yeah, Re- Revison, Mrs. Slavi Wolf, thank you so much for spending the time with us. That was great. It was actually a few months in in, in the it works was. To, it was. to get her. Um, but it, it was really good. She's, well worth the wait. She's so wise, so insightful. And, and it was. I thought it was so classic when we asked her what like if, what's the worst advice she ever got. Like she seemed like the person. Like she probably did get bad advice, but like it, she didn't absorb it. She's right. such a, you know, I, I think you know her Positive, parents. Yeah, yeah, really gave her that like mindset of just focusing on the good and just being in the moment, and it was really good. So, anyways, guys, we are gonna miss you next week because it's Pesach, and we hope you all aren't eating chametz and doing those types of stuff on Pesach. Obviously, if you find that lava underneath your bed during Pesach. Shh, don't <laughs> Anyways, we will be right back after Pesach, though, with some amazing episodes. We so don't worry, we have got you. Maybe almost, I think, almost 10 episodes ready to go. Ready to roll. And, and like, just to explain, that means we sat down with people in the past two months and we just recorded these episode after we episode. We sacrificed our Sundays, our Mondays. Our... You look at it like that? No. Sacrifice. No. Also, no, it's not Mondays. It's Monday no, it's nights. Not Monday. Yeah, Sundays. It's... Okay, it's our Sundays, but it's, it's, it's a privilege. No, no. Um, I, I always finish off with, with a task. Yes, a um, task. Okay. Whatever a thing. Like, and don't forget. Yeah. Don't forget. This this one's actually serious. Don't forget to actually reach out to that one Rebbe, that one mower, that one teacher that made a big difference to you. It could have been something very small, but find out their number, find out their email, and reach out to them and tell them how appreciative. Rebbe Howard Tal, seventh grade. You were the best. Are you gonna reach out to them? Yeah, of course. Okay. See you soon. Ciao.